monthly we have lots of exciting invitate uh, content to share with you this year so i hope that you will continue to join us for future events my name is nancy kelly and i serve on the steering committee and as a founding member of nyc builds bio I am joined by my fellow founding and steering committee member, Mitch Simpler, managing partner of JVB. Would you like to say hello, Mitch? Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the new year and uh, looking forward to a really terrific set of programs and uh, that will make us all better and smarter in this amazingly emerging field. So Nancy, take it away. Thanks, Mitch. I would like to acknowledge the founding and corporate members of NYC Builds Bio who make all of this programming possible, uh, including Triumvirate Environmental. And we have a lot of new people joining us this afternoon. So I just wanted to give you a brief intro to NYC Builds Bio for those of you who are just getting acquainted. NYC Builds Bio is the premier organization for real estate design and life science professionals. We connect the life science and real estate communities through events, research, reports, and educational programs, both in person and online. NYC Builds Bio is a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving as the go-to place to find information about and assistance with growing, building, and locating companies in the greater life science companies in the greater New York metro area. We're excited to welcome all of you to the first webinar uh, of our sponsored seminar series with Triumvirate Environmental. This webinar is entitled Overview of the Greater New York Metro Life Sciences Economy and Subclusters. A recent New York City city planning study of the Greater New York Metro Life Science Economy concluded that the New York Metro area, which includes New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, enjoys the largest life science economy in the United States. And the 2021 census data shows it growing faster than many other regions of the country. We have six experts to tell you all about that today. Matthew Raskowitz, Regional Planner, New York City Department of City Planning. Sue Rosenthal, Senior Vice President, Life Sciences and Healthcare, New York City EDC. Lindsay Harcum, Director, New Jersey Bioscience Center and New Jersey Economic Development Association. Bridget Gibbons, Director, Economic Development, Westchester County, New York. Don Hosevar, President and CEO of Bio Connecticut. And John Bordeaux, President of Advanced Connecticut. This seminar series will run for eight episodes from January through August, 2022 each covering different life science subclusters in the greater New York metro area in more depth. All of these subclusters are growing up around existing academic institutions and new private life science development in neighborhoods, which each has its own distinct social culture and recreational flavor. The next seminar is scheduled for February 22nd on Midtown West and Long Island City in Manhattan. Registration is open, so be sure to sign up after this event to learn more. And be sure to check out our website for other upcoming events. Before I turn it over to Triumvirate Environmental for introductions, I just wanted to cover a few administrative details. We have over 300 people registered for today, so please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program to minimize technical difficulties. There is a program in PowerPoint highlighting the host, sponsors, speakers, and content for the meeting. These will be posted on the NYC Builds Bio website. After the meeting, the program is being recorded and will also be available on the website and our YouTube channel. If anyone's having technical difficulties accessing the Zoom room or other issues, please email info at nycbuildsbio.org or send a notice through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Since most of you are participating in listen-only mode, please feel free to submit your questions via Q&A at the chat button. 
Uh, we will open up for discussion and Q&A at the end of the program and we will address as many questions as we can. At the end of the meeting, we will also have a chance for smaller randomized groups to meet in separate rooms where you can open your videos and microphones and talk to each other. You can stay as long as you would like to get to know each other and share stories. Uh, we, I think the link to the next series uh, in the webinar series uh, is up in the chat box if you wanna take a look. Now I would like to introduce Alicia Aniello, General Manager, New York Branch Triumvirate Environmental, the lead sponsor for this seminar series. Alicia. Thank you, Nancy, um, uh, and, and Mitch as well. I'm so glad that you agreed to collaborate on this series with us at Triumvirate Environmental. Uh, the life science community in the New York metro area benefits so much from all the presentations and events that New York City Builds Bio puts together. Um, you know, bringing together researchers in the real estate community wasn't really, it was kind of a foreign concept uh, just a handful of years ago, uh, but you noticed that there was a need for that and you've, putting, you've been putting together really fantastic programs in the past handful of years. Um, so thank, thank you for all that you do um, and thank you for agreeing um, to, to put this series on. Uh, as Nancy said, my name is Alicia Aniello. I am the general manager of Triumvirate's New York and New Jersey operation. Uh, Triumvirate has been uh, the premier environmental health and safety service provider to the life science community going on 34 years now. Uh, from laboratory moves to regulatory setup, permitting, on-site support, including waste disposal. We've partnered with hundreds of life science companies from their early stages uh, in incubators through to production and manufacturing stages. Um, it's really been uh, awe-inspiring um, and a privilege to witness some of these, uh, these ideas come to life. There's been some really, really interesting stuff happening here um, in New York, as well as across the country, of course, but um, it's really fun when you can see this, this strange little idea come to life. Um, and to be part of that process. Um, at the request of some of our longest clients um, in, the, in the Cambridge area, because that's where we started in Boston back in 1988, um, a lot of our long-term clients from Cambridge said, hey, we're moving out to California, you know, um, 10 years ago and said, Triumvirate, when are you coming out to California? Um, so what we did, we opened up shop in California so we could continue to service our clients at a national level. Um, and now that we have this national presence um, and now that the New York metro area has this huge uh, economy for life science, we're going to be the next life science hotspot. Um, I thought of putting this presentation on as a means to showcase our community's potential to a greater audience. Um, so uh, with this New York City Bio Builds, uh, Builds Bio series, uh, you know, we're hoping to introduce our life science clients from across the country to the excitement and growth that's happening in the New York metro area. Um, the hotspots now like Cambridge and San Francisco, they are running out of space. Uh, they, they're charging a premium um, for some of the uh, limited laboratory space that's left. Uh, this is probably the first time in history where, um, you know, it's actually cheaper to move to New York, um, at least while the, while the going's good. Um, so, um, you know, uh, as Nancy mentioned, the potential for collaboration with our research hospitals and universities, along with the growing amount of space dedicated to life science here in the New York area makes our, our locale ripe with possibility. Um, it's also going to be the community. This is near and dear to my heart, right? I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Um, uh, it's going to be the community on this call that I think will be key uh, to the revitalization of some of our communities and our post-COVID reality, where so many office workers are now working remotely, right? So there are plenty of spaces that are empty, um, and if we could fill them um, uh, with, the, with folks from the science space, I think that'd be fantastic. Um, are we, uh, I want to see which slide, we could go to the next slide if you'd like. Uh, Triumvirate, just to bring it back to New York, Triumvirate has a full operation in New York City since 2003, including the only commercially permitted hazardous waste facility in the five boroughs. Uh, we are the only local resource in this market and having that facility puts us in the same seat as so many of our clients. We're under full scrutiny from the New York City DEP, the FDNY, uh, New York State DEC, along with, of course, the EPA and OSHA and all of that. Um, but we're visited very regularly by the regulatory agencies. 
Um, we've been providing EHS support and consulting, waste disposal support, emergency response services uh, to some of the largest institutions in New York City for over 20 years. We've watched our clients grow within their spaces in New York City and then graduate to large R&D and manufacturing facilities in Westchester and in New Jersey. So we've already seen this migration happening um, prior. And I, I think this is a, a, a great seminar um, to, to uh, allow to showcase for that. Uh, we have over 40 consultants local to the New York metro area and a fleet of just as many vehicles providing regulated medical and hazardous waste services in the area. We're providing services to the vast majority of the life science spaces that we will be covering in this eight part series. Uh, we have partnered with these spaces on a variety of levels, either directly with the leasing agencies or with facility management companies or with landlords or with tenants directly or some combination of, of all of those. Um, we can customize our offerings to fill all EHS needs through one vendor, thus leaving the researchers to remain hyper-focused on their science and the success of their business, which is really what we want. So again, a just big thank you to Nancy Mitch, New York City Builds Bio, for providing us with this platform um, to be able to spread the word about the developments here in the New York metro area. Thank you to all of our speakers here today um, and uh, of course those that are going to be joining us uh, in the future parts of the series. Thanks so much. Great, thanks Alicia. Matt, I think you're up next. All right, thank you Nancy and thank you Alicia and then thank you all for for joining this afternoon. My name is Matt Waskevitz and I am a regional planner with New York City's Department of City Planning. Now our office was formed back in 2015 as a way to help the city address challenges that require thinking at a broader metropolitan scale. And so let me start off by saying what we mean when I say the region. So this is a, this is a picture of the New York City metropolitan region's economy. Our region covers three states, 31 counties, and about 75 miles in every direction from New York City. So that's roughly the reach of our regional rail network. We are the largest economy in the country. And in fact, if we were our own country, we'd have the GDP equivalent of that of about South Korea. So about 50% of our GDP is generated within the city. And about 50% of this GDP is generated outside of the city. So New York City is, it's the economic hub and engine for our region, but the city and its surroundings are, are reliant on one another for its continued economic success. And so it is an incredibly diverse economy that fires on all cylinders in a lot of different ways. For example, you can see blue dots. These are hubs for office-based jobs in places like Midtown Manhattan, but also in other places like Stanford, Connecticut, and White Plains, New York, and Westchester County. You can see the yellow dots. These are healthcare and institutional jobs in, in hubs along the east side of Manhattan, Northwell Health and Stony Brook out in Long Island, Yale and New Haven, and Rutgers down in New Brunswick. You can also see purple industrial manufacturing and warehouse jobs that line major highways uh, and corridors like the I-95 corridor. And so life sciences cuts across all of these industry groups, especially when we're talking about research and development and pharmaceutical manufacturing. And so it struck us that, that when many people look at New York City's life sciences economy, they're not looking at it from the, the broader scale of the full region, although other leading life sciences metros, namely Boston and the Bay Area, are looked at through this broader metropolitan scale. So when we took a look at our life sciences economy using the full understanding of our metro region, it painted a very different picture. Uh, next slide, please. Unsurprisingly, because we're the largest economy in the country, we are also the largest life sciences economy in the country when you add us all up together. About 144,000 jobs, which is 20% more than the next leading metro, and it's about 35% more businesses than the next leading metro. And so when you consider all of these clusters together from Yale and New Haven, Stony Brook, Princeton, and of course, Manhattan and all of the jobs right here in New York City, it's a lot of jobs and a lot of employment in the life sciences across our metro region. Next slide, please. But it's not just jobs, there's also a lot of talent here. Although our metro is home to about 7% of the US population, it houses about 15% of the country's biochemists and biophysicists, and about 10% of the chemists in the United States. We also have about 20,000 clinical lab workers, which is about 25% of our, our technical life sciences occupations. And so this 84,000 figure you see here is really split up among different parts of our region. About 30% of these workers live in New York City. About 40% of these workers live in Northern New Jersey. 
and the rest are split among the different parts of our region. Next slide, please. Looking at investment, our region is number one in NIH funding when you compare us to other metros. Boston's at about $2.8 billion. The Bay Area is about 1.5, but we're at more than 3.5 billion when you add up all of the parts of our metro region together. About 70% of that funding comes from New York City-based institutions and organizations. The remaining 30% is coming to institutions and organizations that are within our region, but are outside of New York City. Next slide, please. Our VC funding is still behind the two other leading metros, but it's, it's growing at a much more accelerated pace. So we have about $3.3 billion in venture capital funding at last counts. And more than three quarters of all of the region's VC funding is concentrated in the New York part of our metro region. Next slide, please. And so lastly, if you look at the geography of where this investment is occurring, highly clustered in New York City at the center of our region. So this is a map of the National Institutes of Health funding across our metro. You can explore a dynamic version of this data on our website at nyc.gov region. But what you see on this slide is Manhattan and the interior of New York City are very important to our overall funding picture. Next slide, please. And so New York City-based institutions account for this 70% of our region's NIH funding. But as you can see, we're surrounded by a constellation of, of growing clusters. We see Westchester, County and areas around Regeneron to the north of the city as one source of this, this investment. We also see Yale pop out along the Connecticut coast and Yale being the single uh, greatest source of, of NIH funding in our region on its own. And then you see Long Island in a cluster around Stony Brook as, far, as well as clusters closer in towards Queens. Um, and then if you track down in Northern New Jersey, there are major medical institution, education institutions like Princeton, New Brunswick and Newark that line the Northeast Corridor Rail. And so all of these clusters are connected to one another through our region's rail network, which truly is a competitive advantage and is the connective tissue that allows talented workers to flow from one part of our region to another. And this funding towards transit-oriented locations matches what we've seen in lab space investment as well as startup growth in our metro area. And so when you look at all of this together, it paints a picture for enormous opportunity for New York City as the center of a very large and a growing life sciences ecosystem. And with that, I will turn things back over to Nancy. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting to me, Matt, um, especially is that this sits right at the heart of the Eastern Corridor, right? From Boston all the way down to North Carolina, connected by Amtrak, uh, and so it's kind of right in the center there. Um, and this is also, we should point out, the largest concentration of uh, life science and tech activity in the world. It's not, it's not just the country. Um, this East Quarter, which I just talked about, um, it's very significant. I, Nancy, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as a, as a regionalist that we tend to think in terms of different scales. And what you suggest here is something that we think about in part, which is how you have the city and you have our metro region, but we're part of a Northeast mega region that stretches from Boston all the way down to the Carolinas with that rail corridor as its main link. And another part of the work that we do is think about the region's transportation investments and the city, the state, and the federal government are all working in concert to, to invest in our rail infrastructure as well. So I think it bodes well for the future of connectivity within our metro area and throughout the greater Northeast with New York being right in the center of it, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so now let's focus on um, each of these sub-markets and find out specifically what's going on. Uh, Sue, do you wanna um, tell us about New York? Thank you, Nancy, and, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really lovely to be here. Um, I lead our New York City Economic Development Corporation's Life Sciences and Healthcare team. Um, and just like Matt and everyone here, we're really proud of our region. And we know it's incredibly important to invest in the talent and the infrastructure needed to continue to build on the opportunity in life sciences um, that will bring uh, you know, much, much opportunity for our economy and for all of our constituents. Um, so with that, if you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, we've been investing in life sciences in New York City for some time. Um, and, um, you know, we, we focus on industries at EDC that show resiliency and promise given our talent and our innovative strengths. And in 2016, 
the city announced a major investment of $500 million in life sciences. And unfortunately, with a bit of a silver lining, the pandemic only heightened our awareness of life sciences and the opportunity. Um, and, and fortunately for the industry, it showed both the value of the industry and its response to the pandemic, whether that was through testing or vaccines and therapeutics, um, as well as life sciences being one of the industries that frankly stayed open and grew over the past two years. And so given that, um, former Mayor de Blasio announced with EDC that the city is doubling that investment this past June to $1 billion. Uh, and as you can see on the right, um, further Mayor Adams incorporating our plans for growth in his 100 day plan during the election to show his support for our initiative. Um, and you know we don't take our foot off the pedal. With that, we've only continued to, to keep things growing in the city. And so how are we doing that? Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we're focusing on taking the great building blocks that we have in New York City and the region, specifically our talent and our science, and helping translate that into products and platforms that can be commercialized into companies that will form and grow, whether they're from New York City institutions or companies that are expanding their operations here, um, and the resulting jobs and access to those skills and, and career paths for New Yorkers of all backgrounds. And the evidence shows that we're making great headway and we've grown quite a bit since that 2016 announcement. Um, go to the next slide, please. So this map shows New York City before 2016, where you can see we had the foundation of great institutions, whether that be our universities, our academic medical centers, um, other research centers like the Genome Center or the Stem Cell Foundation. Um, we also had the beginnings of the incubators and the step out spaces that we need across the city, like Alexandria on the east side or Harlem Biospace in the Tasty Building in West Harlem, uh, Biobat in Brooklyn. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and since then, um, we've made a concerted effort to build more of the infrastructure needed as well as clustering that infrastructure um, to help resources and talent uh, you know, draw together um, into the, the clusters that you need for life sciences. And you can see several of them are emerging. Um, there's a cluster in Kipps Bay. Um, there's a cluster developing in Long Island City. There's one on the west side um, in Hudson Square and Midtown West. Um, and thinking regionally, these clusters are working really well given the proximity to transit, um, whether that's local within New York City or across the, the tri-state area. And we're really mindful to support that regional leadership in life sciences, as we know there's a talent flow in and out of the city for this industry that's critical to all of our success. Um, we've seen many of these investments come to fruition, and I'd like to highlight just a few as examples to show the approach we're taking for the long-term success of the industry. Next slide, please. So Velocera Therapeutics is a spin out from Wild Cornell. They're working on chromosomal instability to develop therapeutics to fight cancer that now calls West Harlem its home. And you can see from the social media posts here that they're very active in our ecosystem, um, supporting the talent uh, that we, we are growing and elevating New York City in life sciences. And originally before Velastra took over the space, EDC invested in, in building that space um, and Velastra grew into that location from its launch uh, in New York City at J Labs. Um, and Matt showed earlier um, you know, points about VC funding and, and NIH funding and how it's grown in the region. That's translating into companies like this one uh, growing and choosing uh, not only to locate, but for talent choosing to locate in New York City as well. And some additional examples we see of great capitalization like this and then expansion um, are happening quite frequently. So we see whether that uh, were recent announcements by Immune AI or Opentrons or Stablix or Black Diamond, we could keep naming many of these examples from the past uh, few months. And if you think about it, 10 years ago, you could probably count the number of life sciences companies in New York City just out loud. Um, but um, you know, that's changed quite a bit. And prior to the pandemic, we did a scan um, to see how much progress had happened and how much had developed. And at the time, this was about November of, of 2019, um, we counted 150 life sciences companies. Um, we've now seen that double. Uh, in the fall in 2021, we did another count um, and we found 300 companies at, at that time. And we've also seen the raises that these companies are announcing grow um, as we've seen companies move from seed to series A, B and C um, and IPO as well. And we've heard continued sentiment that the talent and innovation is here in New York City and in our region. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to highlight a similar and yet different example. Uh, C16 Biosciences is a startup that recently expanded from Biolabs at NYU Langone into the Hudson Research Center. And I highlight C16 because they produce 
a sustainable alternative to palm oil, which is not your traditional life sciences company. But life sciences is broad. It's really the intersection of biology and technology. And that includes using chemistry and synthetic biology to create foods like synthetic palm oil or products related to sustainability. And we believe New York City has an advantage here given its experience in a number of industries, whether that be tech or food or fashion or more. And while traditional life sciences is a large focus of the biotech investment community, we also recognize the opportunity in adjacent life sciences verticals. And we're making investments to take advantage of those intersections and see New York City already as a leader in this space. Next slide. And our last example is one of several infrastructure investments we've made to make sure companies have the resources they need, whether it be incubation space or step out space, and also that talent is being developed in New York City such that companies will have access to great leaders and great functional expertise on the cutting edge of science, whether that be to grow a company from scratch or to scale up uh, or to help in, in other functions like business operations. And we're focused on ensuring that talent development and access to career paths is done equitably and that New York City does what it can now to close gaps in equity at the same time. Through efforts like those that are shown at the bottom of the slide, where we're investing in diverse entrepreneurs and talent and through programs, next slide please, like our great internship program, which has been running for over four years now and has had over 400 interns across well over 100 companies. Uh, and so what's next? If you go to the next slide, please. Well, when I started, um, I shared that New York City is bullish on life sciences and has doubled its, its investment. And we foresee several investments being announced or coming online this year. Um, and over the course of the next couple of years, uh, by about 2024, we anticipate seeing three to four million square feet coming online. Um, and investment in startups, we expect to continue to expand and take, uh, keep going on the pace that they've been going such that companies and talent will keep choosing New York City and this region as their home. We're definitely here for it. And we know that that will lead to a healthier New York and a healthier region. And with that, Nancy, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Great, so exciting. You know, as somebody who's been involved in the growth and development of this sector in New York for over 20 years now, doesn't seem possible. Um, it just Nancy, so you're one of the founders. If, you know, credit to you for helping get you know lay the foundation for all of this. It's so gratifying to see it all come together like that, and all the programs that you've put in place are just amazing in terms of bringing the community together as well. So, congratulations um, Thanks, for all of this. Um, next, we're going to move over to New Jersey, where there is a, um, a similar growth story happening. And Lindsay, uh, you, you were in New York, you're now in New Jersey and uh, helping to lead the charge over there. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Nancy, for bringing this panel together to, to cover the region. I appreciate that. And thank you for uh, Susan. Uh, enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that presentation. My name is Lindsay Harkum. I'm the director of the New Jersey Bioscience Center. This is NJEDA's research park. And I also get involved with some of the other um, states' life science real estate initiatives. Uh, prior to EDA, as uh, Nancy mentioned, I was with New York City EDC. So really congratulations to Susan and the team in New York City for the continued success with the LifeSci NYC program. I really feel it's great for the region and I hope we can get back uh, later during the Q&A to some of the discussion that Matt started regarding uh, kind of a regional perspective. So uh, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about the New Jersey life science ecosystem from the real estate angle, uh, starting with the New Jersey Bioscience Center. This is the park that I am associated with. It's a 50 acre research park, some 30 miles uh, down the turnpike from the Holland Tunnel, uh, 300,000 square feet of life sciences space for startups and growing companies, there's incubator space, there's post incubation space. We do have a, one large tenant in the form of BI, but you know, most of the space here is held by uh, early stage companies. Uh, and I'll go into that. Uh, next slide. So at the, the other extreme from uh, Borenjo Ingelheim is the incubator. Incubator at North Brunswick, it's 46,000 square feet, 27 private wet labs. Uh, solvent fr uh, friendly, chemical friendly environment, uh, office and storage, lots of air handling equipment and air turnover is pretty high. Uh, 
A small lab like you see here is 900 square feet. It's a private lab, it includes a chem hood. It's about $2,600 a month. And for certain biotech companies that may qualify, there's a program called NJ Ignite. So you can get four or five more months, perhaps free uh, if, you're, if you're eligible. Uh, and NJ Ignite is one of several, several programs. Our incubator has had some notable graduates, Amicus, um, GeneWiz started here. Right now we do have some interesting companies. Uh, there's a Cornell Medical School spin out that's uh, Sondra RX located here and continues to expand. We have a company in the IVF space with license uh, technology and license from uh, Michigan State University. We have an oncology company with uh, technology and license from WashU. So it's a, it's a good community and uh, good space. Additional space actually will be opening up very soon. So next slide. So demand for biotech space in New Jersey um, and I think most everywhere right now over the past couple of years has been particularly strong. Uh, the, the, some of the biggest demand for us has been what I call kind of the post incubation space. This sort of a uh, sweet spot of 2000 to 8,000 square feet. Uh, one product that we have for this niche is a multi-tenant environment called the Step Out Labs. Um, we have other private spaces as well, 5,000 and 7,000 and 12,000. But the case of the Step Out Labs, it's a multi-tenant environment with a lot of shared resources um, for companies graduating from the incubator and also you know, biopharma companies with modest lab needs. They have a lot of, lot of resources there available to them. Next slide. Uh, but um, you know, my research park isn't uh, the only game in the state, uh, according to CB Richard Ellis, JLL, uh, some of their annual reports. There's over 20 million square feet of life sciences space uh, in, in New Jersey. The samples listed here, the line items reflect those sites that are developed and under development, but uh, the 20 million top level number uh, is existing space. And so that's a lot of space. It's competitive with RTP and, and a lot of areas outside of Boston and San Francisco, but it, it does really speak to the level of activity that's taking place here in New Jersey's life sciences ecosystem, both pharma and, uh, and on the entrepreneurial side. And, and you know, since Jersey is a center of pharma, a lot of the 20 million square feet is owner occupied by those, uh, by those companies. But there have been several former pharma sites that have been redeveloped and converted to uh, multi-tenant sites. So there's a couple of examples on here. The first one is the On3 campus. This is the former Roche site, some 10 miles outside the, um, uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, 116 acres, eventually a million square feet. Uh, uh, Modern Meadow is there. Quest built their largest diagnostic facility there at 250,000 square feet. Hackensack Meridian is there. At Center of Excellence is in Bridgewater. This is a former Sanofi site, um, close to a million square feet of space there. That's uh, owned and operated by Thor. Princeton West is actually uh, a former BMS site in Princeton Hopewell area, about a million square feet, 433 acres, uh, PTC Therapeutics signed a 185,000 square foot lease there recently. And there's several others that are listed on there, um, perhaps a little bit closer to the city or a couple of uh, multi-tenant projects in Jersey City. Uh, Nancy mentioned, or will mention, the Cove, I believe. It's, it's 14 acres, 3 million square feet under development, half of which is life sciences and healthcare. And then that's, a, that's an exciting project. Uh, 95 Green is a former Colgate toothpaste factory uh, that has some new tenants as, as well. Not listed here, and, and really more of an institutional site for research collaborations, and, and we'll have some tenant space as well. There's a new site under development called The Hub in New Brunswick. It's adjacent to a, a rail line, which as Matt mentioned, is very important. It's adjacent to Rutgers, it's adjacent to uh, J&J headquarters site. And it's bringing together Princeton, Rutgers, Hackensack, Meridian as some of the anchor tenants. Uh, there was a groundbreaking in December to get that program underway. And there's even other private investment that's taken place recently in the state. Uh, there's a company out of India called Aryabindo that uh, not that long ago, built 600,000 square feet of life sciences space uh, in East Windsor. That brings their total to a million square feet. 
in the state that they've built alone. So our, our, our pain point um, is as much lab space because there's space that's here and it's under development. But I, I would say, we know we do need more appropriate spaces that are closer to the urban area. So that's um, you know, one of the reasons that the Cove is an exciting development moving, moving forward. Next slide. And filling that space uh, is a lot of name brand pharma companies and some small companies as well. There's some 2,200 life science companies residing in New Jersey. Uh, next slide. And those companies draw a lot of talent. Uh, Central and North Jersey is uh, ripe with, with pharma talent. Uh, and as you can see here, it compares favorably to other regions. So it's a great pharma community with, with uh, a, a good cross section of talent. Next slide. And um, so there's pharma talent and there's also entrepreneurial activity as well. I mentioned uh, the site I'm associated with incubator in North Brunswick, but there's other incubator sites. Uh, Celgene started um, uh, a nice incubator in Summit uh, with John Anthus at the lead a few years ago. BMS of course um, uh, can, operates that site and it can, it's ongoing. Uh, the Princeton Biolabs, site is depicted here. That's part of the Biolab franchise that's across the country at NJIT, which is an engineering school. Uh, the VentureLink program run by Will Lutz actually has some lab space as well in their incubator. Uh, Keene University has a beautiful space called uh, ILSA uh, and complementing some of their incubator space, a variety of programs, including an, an accelerator. So uh, there's activity at the early stage entrepreneurial end as well. Next slide. And I won't cover all of this, but there are some incentive programs and there are some existing ones and some that we've uh, in, expanded as well. Uh, I think one of the most interesting ones for drug discovery biotech is the angel investor tax credit. Uh, angel, it's really for institutional investors as well. But this is where companies can get, uh, investors can get 20% return on their investment up to 25 in some cases for a tech or life science company that's uh, in New Jersey. It's a maximum of $500,000 per investor per round, annual pool of $35 million. It's fully refundable, meaning that uh, the angel or the institutional investor doesn't have to be located in New Jersey. We have one of our companies in the research park. They've been very successful at raising tranches of eight to $10 million. Most of their investors, uh, whether they are high net worth individuals or institutional investors are located in Europe, uh, it's fully refundable. The checks go to Europe. Uh, net operating loss program, you know, unless you're doing research reagents or services, uh, you're losing money in drug discovery. And so this is a way to monetize some of those losses. Uh, Evergreen Fund is actually a, a new co-investment fund that uh, will be launched soon. So there's other programs, but uh, with that, uh, Nancy, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, that's really exciting story, Lindsay, especially after the transition that New Jersey has gone through uh, with the pharmaceutical industry over the last 10 years or so. Um, and to see the economy shifting towards this more, you know, entrepreneurial activity uh, is really exciting. Thank you. Great, uh, so now we're gonna move north of New York City to Westchester County. Um, Bridget, you wanna tell us what's going on up there? Yes, thank you so much, Nancy. And the presentation so far have just been so informative and I think really shed a lot of light on how vit vital our region is. Before I jump into my presentation, I just wanna say the bottom line is Westchester County is open for biosciences businesses. We have a robust, e robust ecosystem with Regeneron as the heart of the ecosystem, pump, you know, pumping vitality throughout the county. Uh, you know, all those maps and graphics that Matt showed you, Westchester County is almost dead in the middle. So we really do have always had a regional approach and the businesses here, the biosensors businesses here in Westchester, uh, hire employees not only from Westchester in the city, but also Connecticut, New Jersey. So we've always had 
kind of a regional perspective. I do think Westchester is a well-kept secret. So our goal is to really educate people about our ecosystem. Um, and we've been, we've had a lot of success uh, over the last year when we really put a concerted effort into this. And we're really getting the word out about Westchester County, not only in the region and the country, but also in, in the world. So we're really excited about kind of bringing Westchester out uh, to with more visibility. So next slide, please. So Westchester County Life Sciences ecosystem, we, Westchester accounts for 20% of all New York State Life Sciences employment. Uh, that's due in large part to Regeneron, but we do have a robust ecosystem. We're the fifth largest life sciences cluster in the United States. Uh, patents issued have doubled from 20, 2000 to 2015, up to 13, uh, 1,307. Um, we have research institutes focus, focusing on neurosciences and brain injury, autism, and other, uh, you know, other forms. Um, we have, we're in the process of developing a rare, a rare disease hub. Uh, there are clinical trials network with $500, $5 million grant from New York State. We have a bio, the Westchester County Biosciences Accelerator Program which we started three years ago. We're up to have 18 um, startups that have gone or have gone through or will be going through that program. Um, we, we, there we have a life sciences incubator at the New York Medical College and lots of uh, other uh, you know, associated experts and, and real estate, which I'll go into further in the, in the, in the presentation. Next slide, please. So here's a list of our academic institutions, institutions and research institutes. I think, you know, again, this is kind of basic information, but I don't think Westchester is really as well known as some of the other um, areas in our region. So we have plenty of uh, institutions, colleges, um, you know, with all sorts of specializations. So next slide, please. And hospitals, we have, um, you know, branches of the hospitals that are, you know, throughout the region have, have opened in Westchester County, Montefiore, New York Presbyterian, uh, Northwell, and, and, and we have a large uh, medical institution, uh, Westchester Medical Center in Valhalla. Um, so we're very robust and very dynamic and um, important healthcare sector in Westchester County. Next slide, please. Um, we have a mix of, you know, all sorts of uh, biosciences companies ranging from drug, drug development, um, you know, startups and, and established companies, Regeneron, of course, which developed the Regencove therapeutic, which was used uh, by one of our uh, prior presidents when he was uh, diagnosed with, uh, with COVID. Uh, so, well, you know, well-known um, uh, treatment uh, coming from Regeneron, but many of our other uh, startups and companies in Westchester County were involved in the response to COVID, but also, um, you know, just a really robust infrastructure here. So next slide, please. Um, it's kind of small, but we have uh, an interactive map where we, we mapped out all of the um, biosciences uh, companies as well as related companies. And uh, if you get your hands on this presentation and click on that link, you'll see, uh, you know, we have 186 entities that we have mapped. And I know there's a, a plan and a goal of mapping the entire region so that all, you know, all, all the participants in the region and life sciences would be on one map. But you can see the density here. And we do have a physical cluster in, in kind of the central part of, of the county where Regeneron is, New York Medical College, and a lot of uh, and some other development will be taking place to really fill out that 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 uh, that cluster. So next slide, please. Um, and NIH grants, uh, 150 million dollars uh, in grants in Westchester County between 2012 and 2020. You can see there's kind of a a a um, an area of excellence around aging, neurology, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, and spinal cord injury. That accounts for 45% of the NIH grants in Westchester County. So, you know, we are in that 30% that, that Matt referred to, and we have about $150 million in NIH grants. Next slide, please. Um, we have established a biosciences task force, and that we established at the beginning of 2021, uh, really to um, put a concerted effort and a focus on the biosciences in Westchester County. We know we have areas that need attention and need growth. Uh, we have a talent pipeline committee. We're focused on incentives and investment. Unlike the states uh, that surround us in New York City, we, we as a county, we don't have a lot of um, tools that we can bring to bear to attract and retain businesses. So we know 
that we need to develop those and establish um, incentives. And we're looking to establish an investment fund, real estate. Um, if we do have incubator, we do have step out space. I think it's a matter of kind of organizing it and really letting people know what we have here that's available. Um, and we need to establish more suitable graduation space. We focused on the supply chain, you know, wanting to build that out so that more um, of the production and development and manufacturing is done here in Westchester County. We're looking to establish a soft landings program that would allow us to attract and retain um, more businesses here. And we are looking to establish more support for our earliest stage companies. Next slide, please. Um, one, one of the key components of our, our, our ecosystem is the North 60 that is a project that is in development. It will allow us to have, it will be a total of 80 acres devoted to uh, life sciences with combination of lab space, a medical office, um, a residential hotel um, and um, you know, restaurants. And it will be a live work play um, campus. And um, we're looking forward to having, having that on board. If we go to the next slide, please. So this kind of shows you we'll have medical office, biotech and research, there'll be a children's science and education center, shopping, hotel, et cetera. So th 3 million square feet is in the process of kind of um, getting towards a uh, shovel in the ground and development. So we're looking forward to that really kind of establishing. And that also is adjacent to Regeneron and the New York Medical College. And so really bolstering the, the physical cluster of life, life sciences in Westchester. Next slide, please. And of course, Regeneron, they just announced that, that they are, uh, they have two phases of development on their campus. The, the, the area that's highlighted in red are, is, is phase one and phase two are the gray buildings, um, which they just came to Westchester County to describe that phase two that they're gonna be um, kind of moving forward on that. So a total of 900,000 square feet will be added to their campus, um, eight buildings, three parking garages, power plant up to a thousand new employees, um, which will really, uh, you know, that is a significant impact on Westchester County and the biosciences ecosystem here. We're looking to support them in any way, way we can, as of course, workforce development and, um, you know, and in any way we can, um, you know, make sure that the, that really happens, uh, you know, on schedule and that you know, it really will have a tremendous impact on Westchester County. So ne next, next slide, please. Um, the BioInc at New York Medical College, that is our biosciences incubator. Next slide, please. And um, there are many great features. It's brand, it's very fairly new, turnkey, affordable lab space. There's, they've added comfort space and meeting rooms and office space there. Um, it, 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 it's on the New York Medical College campus. So you have access to uh, collaborate with the faculty and researchers and students and interns, et cetera. So it's a highly successful, uh, incubator, I think it's not well known, so we are doing our best to kind of get the word out there that that this is a great uh, alternative uh, incubator um, to to the city or whatever. If people want to kind of be in a more um, residential area, that this this incubator is a great opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, more about the more about BioInc's of the facilities um, features. Um, and of course, you can review this if you get your hands on the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, some of BioInc's residents, Affinity Biotechnologies, uh, Sapiens Therapeutics, a fast growing company here in, in, in Westchester, Medisprout, Telehealth. Um, so lots of great activity happening here. Next slide, please. Oh, so if you would like further information or to talk about anything I presented, um, you can reach me at uh, bgibbons at westchestergov.com. So thank you very much. That was a great presentation, Bridget. It just shows the richness of what is happening um, in the greater New York metro area. You know, there's just such a diversity um, of projects and, and very, very exciting. Regeneron especially being, you know, one of the, um, one of the big success stories from startup to, you know, huge pharmaceutical, uh, fully integrated pharmaceutical company now, um, which has been amazing. Yeah, it's really been, it's, you know, it is the landmark uh, company in, in the region, I'd say, and they're really just, and they're great corporate citizens. So we're really delighted that they're in Westchester County. Yeah, yeah. So now we turn to Connecticut, which is um, 
the last submarket, but not least. I was born and raised in Connecticut and went to Yale and been on the board of the Jackson Lab for years and years. So lots going on that's near and dear to my heart. Dawn. Thank you very much, Nancy. And um, it's, it's terrific to be with all of you today. Um, so as this was mentioned, um, we are a subcluster to the uh, New York Metro Life Sciences. And here's a quick tri-state map to uh, show you where we sit. Next slide, please. Oh, and I'm sorry, I wanna back up and say, I'm Dawn Hosevar, President and CEO of BioCT. We are the uh, in industry uh, trade association for life sciences in Connecticut. And also with me today, who you'll hear from in a little bit is John uh, Bordeaux, and he is the president of Advanced CT, which is the uh, retention recruitment arm for the state of Connecticut. So um, for those of you that are not familiar, um, this is the map of, of Connecticut, and we have um, from Stanford, New Haven, Branford, actually up towards Rhode Island is the I-95 corridor. And not shown on the map, um, in the northern region um, near Rhode Island is where Pfizer is located. And Pfizer, they have their largest R&D campus is in Connecticut. And they are expanding as we speak. So, um, you know, that's terrific for Connecticut. And on the opposite side of the state, closer towards the New York border is um, Boringer Ingelheim's uh, headquarters. And uh, they're in the Ridgefield area. And uh, they have about 6,000 employees, uh, similar to Pfizer. And one other um, anchor for us is Medtronics, who is located in New Haven. Um, and that's uh, a, a major center for Medtronics. So what's going on? New Haven is the epicenter for the life sciences, and that is due to Yale. Um, Yale has done a tremendous job of spinning out commercializing companies over the last 10 years. Um, Alexion being one of them that was a spin out of uh, Yale is now um, uh, was acquired last year by AstraZeneca. And for those who have heard, uh, Alexion left New Haven, um, only the headquarters went to Boston. Um, Alexion, uh, the R&D center never left and they have about 600 employees and AstraZeneca is uh, leaving Alexion in New Haven and that is their um, rare disease arm of uh, the pharmaceutical company. And um, with all of that growth that's going on, um, there has been expansion. Um, so for instance, Farmington is where we have Jackson Laboratories, we have the Yukon Health Centers, we have some incubators that I'll get into in a moment. Stanford um, is really our up and coming digital bioinformatics IT space. UConn has a campus in Stanford and have just launched a, a, an incubator, um, an IT incubator in that area. And as many of you may have heard, um, Semaphore moved to the Stanford area from Mount, uh, Mount Sinai in New York, and uh, they're just continuing to expand and gobble up companies. <laughs> um, and then Branford is a cluster of graduation space for companies that have uh, outgrown the incubator space in the state. And I'll get into a minute um, of, of what the incubators are all about. But as you can see around the map is uh, uh, just an example of some of the companies that are here in Connecticut. Next slide, please. So regarding lab space, just wanted to give you a, an overview of um, up and coming growing lab space in the area. This is above and beyond any square foot of um, uh, pharma space, et cetera, that already exists in the state. So in New Haven, um, we have a developer that uh, has been just been phenomenal for this industry. And Carter Wynn Stanley originally built the Alexion building. And now 101 College is going to be a sister building to that. They've already broken ground. 
500,000 square feet, 10 stories with 50,000 square feet of incubator space. And that incubator is going to be run and managed by Biolabs. So Biolabs is now in Connecticut and uh, it's just a very, very exciting time. And where those um, um, buildings are is really the uh, innovation corridor, Highway 34 for the build out of life sciences in New Haven. Um, for example, 115 Munson is in the Science Park area, and that's about 140,000 square feet of lab space, which will be a live work residential retail space as well. Um, and uh, they, they've got several companies in the 115 Munson Science Park area today. And then also in New Haven is 55 Church Street, which is the Elm City Biocenter. And um, that was um, office space that has been converted and is being converted to lab space, 114,000 square feet, five stories lab office space. And then because Brantford has a lot of the graduation space today, and those companies are continuing to grow and outgrow their space, there is a conversation going on now to develop an innovation park in Brantford, which is 15 minutes north of New Haven, um, which will have initially 90,000 square feet of lab office space with a second 90,000 square foot building um, coming online. Um, so those are just some examples of the amount of uh, activity that's going on here in, uh, in New Haven and uh, the general region. Next slide, please. So incubators, we have uh, up in Farmington is the Yukon Technology Incubator Program. And they have uh, oh, about 40, 45 companies in that incubator and have raised uh, millions of, of dollars. And a lot of those companies that have graduated in turn went to Brantford um, and are expanding. Groton, there is a BioCT, um, Innovation Commons, which is an incubator space with about 23 companies there. And uh, we were able to, to create that because Pfizer, who is right next door, donated a building to us and we got four and a half million dollars from the state and created this wet lab office incubator space, um, which has been very successful. Um, and then New Haven, as I mentioned, Biolabs is coming in and um, putting in incubator space. And then Pierce Laboratories, uh, Pierce Institute right next to Yale, um, just opened up an incubator space there as well, which uh, BioCT is managing for them. And then Stanford has the incubator space for, um, as I mentioned before, digital IT um, incubation. Um, so it's, it's just tremendous excitement and uh, we're seeing nothing but, but constant growth here. Um, next slide, please. So some of the centers of excellence I just wanna make note of is Yukon Health. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of research and um, um, a lot of papers on um, different areas of cell line growth, et cetera. Um, the Yale Center for Immuno-Oncology, and also the Yale Wusai Institute, <coughs> which are focusing on a lot of the digital, psychological, biological, computational sciences. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Bordeaux from Advanced CT. He can introduce himself and then take over on uh, the slides. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot, Donna, I appreciate it. And thank you, Nancy, and thank you to Triumvirate for uh, hosting today. And, uh, and thanks to my colleagues across the region as well. There's no doubt that this region uh, has numerous assets uh, across it that uh, will attract and retain some of the most exciting uh, life sciences and bioscience companies uh, in the world and are being spun out uh, from this region right now. And it's exciting to, uh, hear about uh, the uh, the uh, innovation that's going on across the region. Just uh, it's it's really really uh, energizing. In Connecticut, one of our uh, one of our assets that we are proud of is Connecticut Innovations, which has a two hundred million dollar evergreen fund 
um, specifically earmarked for life sciences. And uh, our uh, work here uh, with Connecticut Innovations uh, is uh, the, and one of the reasons why it can be evergreen is that the, the companies that they're investing in are constantly uh, uh, growing and graduating and their investments are paying off. And uh, Connecticut Innovations is the leading investor in the state of Connecticut across the board and you know, provides not only the money, but the uh, str uh, strategic guidance, the direction, the connections uh, that uh, you know, a region like ours, a state like Connecticut, uh, you know, we are tightly uh, knit together. And it's in a, you know, a way that these young companies uh, can be uh, uh, truly uh, given uh, the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, across the board. Next slide, please. Uh, you certainly uh, heard a lot about Yale University. Uh, uh, Matt mentioned uh, you're the largest uh, uh, recipient of NIH funding, um, but the uh, Yale's uh, Office of uh, Cooperative Research uh, has been uh, working carefully with the faculty and the research uh, arms of the uh, university that are producing multiple companies, 48 in the last five years, nearly a billion dollars uh, investment capital uh, raised. Uh, Yale is a uh, engine here uh, in New Haven that is creating uh, a, a ecosystem uh, and is certainly a bright star in the, in the middle of that universe. Uh, the the uh, Yale's uh, 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 spinoffs of companies and the way that uh, the university has uh, played a strong role in uh, nurturing the ecosystem is a significant asset for uh, this part of our state and for the ecosystem in general. And being right in the middle of that uh, I-95 corridor uh, between uh, Stanford uh, on the one side and Groton on the other, as Don mentioned, where, uh, where so many wonderful things are happening. Uh, it's definitely at the uh, crossroads of, of bioscience uh, here in Connecticut. The, the, the fact that uh, Yale has made a commitment not only to New Haven, but to this, uh, this uh, ecosystem uh, for multiple years is, uh, is a significant asset. And we anticipate uh, that they will continue and accelerate uh, their, uh, their, their spin outs uh, over the course of the next uh, several years. And we're very excited about it. Next slide, please. University of Connecticut, which Don also mentioned, uh, is uh, the uh, largest producer of STEM graduates in Connecticut. And I think it's important to note that, um, you know, as we look across this region, certainly we think about all of this a lot in Connecticut. Um, workforce is a absolute vital component uh, that, uh, that companies are, are thinking about and certainly in the, in the life sciences. You know, from um, with UConn's uh, commitment, uh, they are producing and thinking very carefully and working hand in glove with uh, industry to help uh, tailor the uh, programs that graduates are receiving uh, in order so that, uh, that graduates are uh, coming into uh, the job market ready to work uh, and ready to uh, participate in these companies, big and small, uh, across Connecticut. And the companies that are, are, are not here yet are the ones that are uh, going to be spun out from Yale in, uh, in the next six months. Um, and this is a, a really important component of the overall strategy here in Connecticut. Uh, the governor, Governor Lamont's uh, 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 Workforce Council uh, has been thinking uh, for long and hard and strategically about this. And, and our uh, workforce development initiatives uh, are not just a round table of uh, university presidents and CEOs, although that does exist, uh, everyone who's involved in that uh, is involved in multiple levels so that the tactical fulfillment of a workforce development uh, is, uh, is achieved and not just uh, uh, bullet points on a strategic plan, but actual tactical fulfillment, um, as I mentioned, at the university level where, uh, where, uh, the, uh, where graduates are being trained for the jobs that are coming, not just the jobs that are available. Uh, and ensuring that we have the workforce available to uh, the companies that are, are here, uh, that are growing, uh, that are coming, and that are being created is uh, a vital component of, of our strategy here in Connecticut. And needless to say, across the region, uh, you know, and this, uh, one of the beautiful things about this region is it is concentrated, uh, and uh, the ability for us to work, whether it's uh, across these, uh, this ecosystem of universities, 
uh, which uh, in the Northeast here uh, in this region is really second to none. I would put our university systems uh, in Connecticut in this region up against anybody's uh, in the world. And I know that we would come out ahead very similarly to the way that as Matt presented in the beginning, the way that uh, that our uh, our ecosystem here is the uh, is the largest uh, in the world. Uh, I would say that our universities uh, and our workforce is uh, really second to none. Uh, and we're extremely proud of that. Next slide, please. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, a little bit further upstate is the Jackson Lab and anybody who's involved in research uh, uh, knows Jackson Lab uh, from uh, for a couple of different reasons, not least of which uh, they are, uh, their genetics and genomics work is, uh, is really on the leading edge. Um, but of course, uh, they are uh, in the uh, vivarium and research mouse business. Um, so I encourage you just uh, for the fun of it, uh, you can go and uh, uh, go on to the Jackson Lab website and get the uh, genetically designed mouse of your choice, um, which uh, I highly encourage, but it's, it, is a, it is a cornerstone in, uh, in, in research. And Jackson Labs, uh, when uh, they expanded out of their headquarters uh, in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, landed in Connecticut, and we're very proud to have them uh, as a, a significant component of our ecosystem. Uh, and as a uh, research institution, a nonprofit research institution, Jackson Labs uh, plays a very similar role to uh, organizations like Yale and UConn uh, in the state uh, and is investing heavily in the primary research and providing the tools to the researchers here um, in a collaborative fashion to uh, help, uh, to help uh, uh, new companies and the companies that are here be very, very successful. Next slide, please. As Don mentioned, uh, I'm the president of Advanced CT. Uh, we are here to help uh, any uh, organization in Connecticut or outside Connecticut to uh, come to our region and be successful um, and to provide uh, those uh, services to, uh, to those who might need them um, and to help uh, grow this community. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, Don, uh, as the head of BioCT, uh, uh, my, my job is to uh, help companies be successful here. And Don's job is to help make sure that our ecosystem is vibrant, connected, uh, and growing. And, uh, and being a component and art and an important part of this region, uh, as I said at the beginning, is very, very energizing to us here in Connecticut. Uh, and to see all that we're accomplishing uh, as a region uh, and the assets that we have and that we share with one another is extremely exciting. And with that, uh, we'll pass it back to you, Nancy, with our thanks and appreciation. Yeah, just terrific, terrific presentation. And um, it's really amazing to watch the development and growth of this industry. You know, having been involved it, when the Jackson Lab first got, um, made the decision to locate their gen genomics facility in uh, Farmington. Um, even just since then, uh, the state has changed so much and really deepened its industry. So congratulations to Don and to you and to everybody who's been involved with that. You know, as I've been sitting here listening to you, I've been thinking a lot about um, the regional play and the regional focus that the federal government is really um, kind of putting on technology and life sciences in particular, and um, the whole Build Back Better program, which um, the, you know, Depart the Department of Commerce uh, just had a program which gave out grants for the development of regional hubs. Um, and North Carolina was the recipient of one of those, um, so there were a couple of, of uh, actually life science hubs that got grants for you know, doing regional initiatives. And we saw you know, in the discussion with Matt, you know, the, the rail systems that kind of um, connect us all, the bridges, the water systems. So if we are connected, how can, what would a regional life sciences initiative look like? if we were all going to be working together. Let's say we, we were thinking about applying for a federal grant that would really um, bring our region together and, and showcase it. What, what might that look like? Matt, do you have a thought on that? Let's start with you. Well, I, 
I would defer on on others to the specifics on it, just because I I come from a planning and economic about development background generally. But what I would say is we have all the right ingredients here, mm -hmm. so we have we have that that access to talent. And I think New York City, there's there's been much in the news the last few years about oh, is this the death of cities? Is this the death of New York City? And in fact, quite the opposite, mm -hmm. in which you've seen record uh, record rents and and, and record investment happening here in the city and you've seen people coming back to New York City and back to cities generally. So I would say we have the talent base here. Uh, we, we have the investment that is that is really growing in the city and we have the ability to to get folks from from one part of the city to the other. We have such a dynamic economy and something that we've thought about is part of the attraction of New York City isn't just an opportunity for, for you to get a job, it's an opportunity for your partner or your spouse to get a job as well. There's such a diverse ecosystem of different types of jobs here in New York and the surrounding region that that is our competitive advantage. It always has been uh, access to these amenities as well. So uh, in terms of what a regional play would look like, I would defer to the others, but I think we have all the right ingredients to, to make one right here. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in there. Um, oh, excuse me. Too, but, Go ahead, uh, Lindsay. I'll jump I think in for you. When I look at um, the study we keep referencing that uh, uh, Matt and his colleagues put together, I mean, number one that jumps out is that uh, as a region, New York City Metro has the largest life science economy in the U.S. So certainly, what it would could possibly look like would be from a marketing perspective. You know, the 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 real estate studies that I referenced earlier during my presentation talked about New Jersey and, and how much life science space is there. And of course, other pages of that of those studies and reports reference talent as well. But you know, when you look at um, from from the talent perspective, uh, we really have the ability to raise a, a regional red flag here um, because talent likes to go where talent is. You know, we're 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 the only um, we're really the only large life science region that's sliced and diced into three different states, you know, and, and I say it's, it's not fair, right? Um, when you look at uh, the life science region of Cambridge, it fans out, you know, for miles into 128, it's still collectively represented in one report. And, you know, the same thing can be said for the San Francisco Bay area, you know, it, it's uh, Santa Clara goes, is 40 miles away from from San Francisco, it's a huge geography, and so you know from that perspective, I don't know why we can't represent it. I mean, my God, San Francisco, their football team's forty miles away, uh, <laughs> and and Giants uh, Jet Stadium Meadowlands is only seven miles from Times Square. So you know, there's there's justification for their for that alone. So um, you know, I think there's an argument to be made to throw a blanket from a marketing perspective over the entire region to represent all of our key assets, not only in terms of life science, real estate, which I default to, but I think just the talent piece is, is so important from what Matt talked about before and what we used to always talk about uh, in New Jersey, for that matter, New York City is, you know, you have a region where a, a, a trailing spouse uh, will, will find opportunities uh, when locating to the region. And that's, that's, that's hard in some other areas. Yeah, great. So yeah, if, I, if I could build on what, what Lindsay is saying, you know, we, we see the flow of, of talent in and out of the city across the region quite heavily, right? So, um, you know, we heard about Regeneron earlier. Um, we know there's quite a bit of talent that commutes to Regeneron from the city and vice versa that comes in from um, Westchester and Connecticut into the city um, and the same for New Jersey. And I, I, I from my own career in life sciences, um, I was based in New York City. I supported uh, pharma companies out in New Jersey. Um, you know, we know that talent flow is happening. And, and to Lindsay's point of talent wants to be where talent is, um, we see that in New York, that, that um, companies want to locate in those clusters, but also people want to know that they have the job opportunity they're in right now. And if that biotech, something happens, because biotech is risky, that they will have opportunity in other, uh, in other ways for other companies. Um, and we're seeing that more and more. And, and you know, I had there's a, a company that folded, um, it was in 2019 or, or uh, early 2020, where all of the employees found their next job in, in New York City. Um, and we actually monitored that because we were curious to see what would happen. 
Um, and because we think that that's the um, type of momentum you need to see um, the, the trajectory of growth in the industry, um, and that those people that all landed in new jobs in, in New York City um, then shared that with their constituents in their, uh, in their network, um, and that attracts talent to continue to, to want to be here. Um, the other part that I'll say, um, but and then I'll come to the actual question, um, is you know we actually hear from CEOs and CSOs that New York City feels different in terms of um, both retention and um, I keep using this word, it's my word of the, the week, gumption, um, and, and that we see that the talent in this region um, is really hungry for growth and development in life sciences. Um, and that there's the, the retention part is that there's a loyalty to um, company growth and, and to the science that's being developed um, that, that we hear remarkably, um, it feels different in New York for the talent that's here. Um, and so one of the thoughts I had for, for your question about how could we um, as a region um, go for um, some of the federal funding, I absolutely agree that we'd have to um, you know, work it out across the group. Um, but I do think there's, there's certainly a talent opportunity um, and given where we are as an industry, where we are as a world, I think there's a, a real opportunity in talent development, uh, talent, talent development, to make sure that um, that we're making that we're closing gaps in equity. And so uh, the first part of that would be to understand what, um, make sure we we align on what skills and talent uh, areas are needed, and and how those can be served um, by different types of. Um, uh, degrees and certifications and qualifications. Um, you don't need a, a PhD for every job in life sciences. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite. It's like, you know, one tenth or one eighth of jobs in life sciences are advanced degrees. Um, right. And so how can we make sure that we are, um, you know, advancing, um, you know, we're growing the, the those advanced degrees in an equitable way, but also that we are making the career paths um, for many different backgrounds more available um, to the, the talent of our region. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was just I was just going to add to the to the kind of the flavor that's that's being discussed here is as a region, we also have the ability to create the quality of life for people to um, you know, not everybody wants to live in downtown Manhattan. Not everybody wants to live in Connecticut. Not everybody wants to live in New Jersey. But between the three states, we mm -hmm. have enough um, diversity and quality of life and ecosystems that would cater to a lot of people. Um, when Alexion did move their headquarters to Boston and when BMS left Connecticut years ago, 90% um, of their workforces would not go because people love being here. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like the shoreline. There's nothing like, you know, the lack of, of uh, transportation issues that some other places have. Now, again, there are the younger people who want the hubbub of the city and they wanna be in the Manhattan, et cetera. So there's a lid for every pot. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a way as a region that we could um, make sure that we're accommodating anybody who's looking to come to our region, that if you know, our state or your particular spot isn't quite what they're looking for, well then, hey, you should look at this or that um, because there's no reason people have to go to California. <laughs> um, so that's another thing to, to think about as well. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the map that Bridget brought up about Westchester County and um, thinking about, you know, your digital incubator there in Southern Connecticut. And if we had a regional map of where companies were located and institutions were located and it was, you know, relatively comprehensive, you could begin to see where the technology pockets are in terms of where they're developing, you know, so maybe synthetic biology is in New York, maybe, you know, digital health is in Southern Connecticut and Westchester would be something else. Um, but when, when people are looking at the region as a whole and they're thinking, okay, there's people like me here, I'm gonna look there, right? Um, I think that might be helpful. 
Right, and, and we did have as a region, thanks to Carolyn Grossman Meager and the New York City Regional Planning Crew, we did have a regional meeting to begin those discussions about how do we unify, how do we present ourselves to the world as a, you know, as a real regional uh, hub and we were talking about branding and and so we we have begun those conversations. I think it, you know we need to kind of explore it a little bit further, but I think we're we're on that path uh, to really position ourselves, at, you know, from marketing, branding, and you know how how we how we work together standpoint. Um, I think we're really on the pathway to to getting there. So, Nancy, if I could, one of the things that occurs to me is for us to leverage the connectivity that we already have. Like one of the things that is is I mentioned in my presentation that's abundantly clear is that this region has the best research uh, and uh, uh, universities on the planet. And there's lots of connectivity among those institutions. And then of course, there are our great companies. And you know, Lindsay mentioned the you know, BI, BI is in Connecticut, BI is in New Jersey. How can we leverage the leadership of our companies that do view this already as a region? Um, and, and, and present ourselves as a region as many of the companies and researchers already think of us as a region. And so what we're competing against is, you know, an external idea that there's some, you know, magical border uh, by a body of water or some cartographer uh, in the 1700s that somehow separates us. Uh, and then taking that together, that type of, of, of the, the workforce uh, items that, that Sue and Lindsay and others are talking about, uh, combined with that leadership, uh, component from a research university standpoint and from a corporate boardroom standpoint starts to tell that really complete story of uh, to the, an external audience. It's the external audience that is is maybe hemmed in and thinking about this as a uh, a, a bunch of different uh, localities and municipalities. Uh, but uh, our workers and our leaders uh, are not thinking about it that way and and act appropriately. And so it makes it a very attractive place to come into if you understand that as that's the way the ecosystem is working. Yeah, no, absolutely. These, these are all really wonderful ideas and thoughts. And hopefully we can continue this conversation and NYC Builds Bio can help um, you know, to facilitate some of this uh, regionally and collect the information or help to market it and brand it in some way. Um, so I just want to ask the audience, I haven't seen any questions put in the chat, although lots of people are uh, giving you guys great um, uh, compliments, great presentations, many thanks, great regional picture, thank you panel. Um, does the audience have any questions that they might like to ask of our experts You don't often get these people in one place? Um, and any feedback too on, um, you know, on the future presentations, right? And what we'd like to hear about most. We keep talking about uh, accessibility and connectivity, right? Um, do we really want to focus on, you know, how you can get from Queens, uh, you know, Long Island City to Manhattan and all the various ways to do that. So you could understand, you know, how these places are actually so much more closely located than you would, than you would assume uh, because of the public transportation that's available um, and various transportation, right? Um, Hi, Nancy. Today. Hello. Hi, I tried to put in a chat question, but it didn't work. Thank you for everyone on the panel. This was wonderful. But I have a real estate community question. Are you guys working with the bio tenant clusters to bring them to empty office buildings in Manhattan? Well, so I, I, I'll take this as a start, but what I would say is, um, you know, we welcome through our programs talking with developers about how to develop the, the infrastructure that's needed. You can't just take an office building and like overnight turn it into a wet lab capable space. Um, buildings have many requirements for that and, and needs. Um, and so we work with the development community on exploring options for uh, for buildings that could be converted, um, knowing that that takes investment and time to to do that. Um, but what I would say is that um, you know there are companies that don't require wet lab spaces, and so certainly the real estate community, I think for all of our region, whether New York City or otherwise, is always open to discussing how to use spaces uh, for the different types of companies and and the industry. 
Um, but for those, those more complex spaces, it requires um, going through quite a bit of conversion. That it's not something that where you where you could just say, if there's empty real estate for that are commercial real estate that's offices, you just convert it to life sciences, just like that. And I will say that um, in future uh, webinars in this series, we will be featuring buildings that have been converted into from commercial office into life science and uh, highlighting the issues and questions surrounding them that have to be analyzed before that change can be made. Mm -hmm. um, I think lots of people in the different emerging subclusters in Manhattan are looking at their buildings now and trying to evaluate them. And many of our members are ev involved in that, those evaluations. So yes, we are, we are quite, uh, quite busy uh, at trying to find empty spaces that, that can use uh, science related activities. Um, and I think it's worth it to point out too, John was talking about, you know, cartographers from the 1700s. We were a very heavy industrial, right? Um, uh, New York, New Jersey, right? All because of the water that surrounds, you know, our islands. So there is plenty of, you know, uh, zoned industrial space. There's a lot of uh, buildings where manufacturing used to happen, right? Um, sounds crazy, but cars used to be manufactured on Manhattan Island, right? Um, something that you, you wouldn't expect, um, but it's true, right? And those are the spaces um, that are, um, that are, are much more primed uh, for, for uh, space like this to be turned into wet lab space. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. This is Tricia. Um, with all of your developers and, um, you know, a 20,000 up uh, tenant, they look at, but what about the 2,500 square foot tenant that, you know, the, the second generation, they really don't have the credit. And are your developers in New York City? I know that in Connecticut, they've got funding and in New Jersey, they've got funding but where do these tenants go? I mean, are they willing to build out 35 or 30,000 square feet for these 2,500 square foot tenants? I think it's being taken into consideration. I wouldn't say that there's um, strong supply for that yet, uh, but I know that several developers have spoken to us about that type of um, intermediary spaces. I think the tricky part with it is that it's often um, not long-term like the larger 20 to 30,000 step out spaces. So there's more risk involved there. And so that's why we have um, some of our levers, whether that's our IDA financial support um, or otherwise to think about how, how can we make sure that those types of resources are available. Um, but, but yes, it is something that's on our radar. Um, with, with the region that we're talking about, um, just wanted to add that if there was companies in New York that are looking for that two to 5,000 square feet spaces, there is that available in New Haven because that's what a lot of the developers, um, as you just mentioned, Susan, the risk involved is pretty high. And so some of our developers have uh, bit the bullet, so to speak, and wanted to do 10,000 square feet, but have realized that there is a, a market. There's a pretty significant market for those smaller companies. And so some of them are trying it and uh, you know, to see how this will work out economically. Um, but until you have a plethora of that where you are, if someone's desperate, you, know, you could tell them to check here. So that's another big plus for taking a regional play, right? If it's not available somewhere, it's available close by. Right. Okay, well, it is 1.30, so I want to thank all of you for participating in what I hope will be just the beginning of a great conversation um, and, you know, ability to work together. Uh, for those of you who have time and would like to, um, we will open up the um, meeting rooms so you can meet and talk to each other. Uh, and for those of you who need to jump, please do. Um, but thanks everyone, both uh, those who spoke and those who attended. We really appreciate your support. And of course, to Triumvirate for sponsoring. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Um, I'm really